Hello, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. We're at Burns Feed Store in Gresham, which is outside of Portland. And uh, I'm here because our baby ducklings are in. Now you may be asking, look, why are you getting baby ducklings? You're already raising turkeys and chicks and you already have a flock with ducks and chickens. So I'm gonna go in and snag the ducklings and show them to you because they're gonna be super adorable. And then talk a little bit about diversifying our strategies in permaculture and why for our family, we think it's important to keep not only chickens, but also ducks and this year turkeys and bees, but how when we embrace diversity in our permaculture design that can make us more resilient overall. Not to mention it's really fun to raise ducklings. They are by far my favorite livestock just absolutely adorable and entertaining and a really, really great choice for the Pacific Northwest. So let me throw my mask on and go in there and grab the ducklings and then I'll be back. All right, well, I had hoped to make this section of the video a lot earlier today, and I ended up needing to help my siblings with some stuff for my dad, and the whole afternoon got away from me. Um, so now it's evening time, and I'm in here checking on the baby birdies. And I thought I would uh, share my thoughts on diversifying livestock in permaculture. I talk a lot about how important it is to diversify the plants that we grow, how important it is to think about uh, not only encouraging a diversity of foods in our diet, but a diversity of species in the landscape. And that's for a number of reasons. When we have many different kinds of plants and uh, animals as well, we are spreading out the risk of a disease coming in and wiping out everything, right? If you have all one variety of sheep that are maybe particularly susceptible to a certain kind of disease, that disease comes in and you have lost your whole investment and you've lost all of your food security and you're in big trouble. But if you raise several different kinds of sheep, or even better, you raise sheep and goats and cattle and geese and ducks, then if you have an illness come through that one species or one breed is susceptible to, you have lost only a fraction and you are able to continue to carry on. I spoke in a recent video about how I plan uh, on losing 20% of my crop every year. I over plant. I over plan with how many chickens or ducklings that I buy, expecting that I will lose a certain quantity. And that way I am kind of self-insuring. And if I have an overabundance, I can then share with the community. So when we're thinking about livestock in a permaculture system, you may say, Angela, like, why are you qualified to talk on large scale livestock? I am not, I have one quarter acre. My livestock are ducks, chickens, bees, and now turkeys. That's all I have experience with. I love sheep. I'm a huge spinner and a knitter and a weaver. And I have friends that are sheep farmers. And I really, in another life, I would live in the country and I would raise sheep. But I don't have that luxury. I am choosing to bloom where I'm planted and I'm choosing to stay in Portland in the city. But these design concepts that I'm gonna be talking about next, while I'm talking about them academically, they are applicable in permaculture design and regenerative agriculture and lots of folks use them. So it works for me on a small scale, having ducks and chickens and now turkeys, they each fill a different niche. So not only do I have different species that are resistant to and uh, conversely susceptible to different diseases, they also fill different niches in my garden. So that's the second reason that we wanna think about diversification when it comes to our livestock. My chickens are a wonderful force for disturbance. I have a video on that. They love to scratch. They're so good at scratching and pecking. And in doing that, they are really good at de, um, denuding your landscape of weeds. They're really good at getting in around the roots of a plant and killing it. That makes them fantastic for coming in and weeding an area. It also means that in some areas, they are not optimal because they can damage plants that you want to keep. This is where ducks are a really great choice. Ducks have obviously their web feet and they do not scratch. They bill with their soft bill back and forth, getting um, invertebrates, 
and then they will eat vegetation, but they don't damage the roots of plants because they cannot peck and they cannot scratch. That means there's places in my garden where I choose to um, sequester my chickens and I do not allow them in those places in my garden, but I will freely turn my ducks out, knowing that my valuable perennials are safe and that the ducks do a great job removing weeds and removing those slugs and slug eggs in particular. This also gets to the element of how ducks and chickens have different preferences in their diet. They both eat greens, they both eat insects. Um, also, my chickens will eat things like uh, snakes that come into the garden, they'll eat mice, they'll eat pinky rats if they can find them. Sometimes my chickens will catch and eat a songbird. Um, that's happened a few times. One of my chickens we used to have a number of years ago was really good at catching and killing the uh, house sparrows in our garden. They are little dinosaurs, that is for sure. So for the ducks, they're really good at eating those large leopard slugs, any of the large slugs that my chickens find particularly unpalatable. I've also noticed that for my ducks, they relish comfrey. It is a food crop that I grow specifically for my ducks. Chickens will eat it. It's not their favorite. It's probably like seven or eight on their list of greens, but it is number one on the ducks list. So if I'm looking at growing plants in my garden that are going to have a value for me, I'm gonna stack functions. Comfrey is a great one that provides duck food and ducks can utilize comfrey much more efficiently than chickens. So that means that keeping ducks in my system makes my comfrey a more valuable plant. It is something that takes the sunlight and turns it into food, which my ducks turn into eggs. Speaking of eggs, Ducks produce up to 300 eggs per year and ducks will lay the entirety of their lifespan. In fact, the first five years in our experience, ducks lay consistently. Where chickens start to taper off after year two, ducks are still cranking out 300 eggs a year, larger than chicken. I also find that ducks are really useful in a soggy part of my garden. You can hear that it's pouring outside right now. We live in a rainy, wet climate and those parts of my garden that are very muddy, where my ducks are like blissed out playing in the mud puddle, loving the rain. My chickens avoid those parts of the garden and will take shelter. Chickens don't like to stand in water. They don't like to be in muddy weather. They don't like to be out in the rain. That means if we have prolonged periods of rain, my chickens are often hiding under the awning and much less effective at foraging. My ducks are out there like doing a great job going after the slugs. Now I added turkeys this year as a meat option. For our family, we have not chosen to raise meat birds in the past. I love duck meat. We're an omnivorous family. I've never, never shirked away from declaring that on this channel. But I have not raised ducks for meat, only for eggs. And that's just because um, of our own family preference. We find the ducks so comical and personable that they become family pets. Our ducks are 10 and 11 years old, except for these new babies, which is why we've added new babies. So for us, turkeys were a great option. We wanted to raise sustainable meat for the holiday table, and they're gonna fill that next niche. Also, turkeys can utilize more of the bugs and invertebrates, and also maybe things like lizards in our garden, uh, tree frogs, things like that. The ducks and chickens haven't really been able to eat. So I'm adding that other layer of the livestock in my garden eat slightly different diets. There is overlap. I don't wanna say that there's not overlap because there is, but they each have their own little unique niches that they fill. So not only am I diversifying as a form of uh, building resilience in my garden against pests and diseases, I'm adding the benefit of a diversity in my diet. Duck eggs and chicken eggs taste very different and they're different for cooking. Do not think about making a fried duck egg. It'll be rubbery and Ugh, like just don't waste your duck egg that way. Make meringue and baked goods with your duck eggs. They make the best meringue. If you wanna make a pavlova, use duck eggs. If you wanna make an angel food cake, use duck eggs. Sort of my thinking at having those three levels. Now let's, let's take a look real quickly here. I know I'm talking a lot, but let's take a look. My bees fill an entirely different role. They are a livestock in my garden to an extent. They're a hosted animal in my garden. I don't manage them. So in that way, I don't treat them like livestock. But they obviously provide a completely different yield than any of the birds who provide meat and eggs and they provide pest control. My bees provide pollination power, wax and honey. So completely different set of harvests and benefits that I'm getting from them in my garden. 
If you're looking at adding larger livestock, you can expect another layer of benefits. This is why so many people in permaculture have a really broad range, that traditional kind of, you know, rural European homesteader farm mentality, where you have a little dabble, a little sprinkling of all kinds of things. You might have one dairy cow that you breed uh, once a year. You might keep a couple of goats and have, uh, you know, goats not only for their ability to clear the landscape, but also for their meat or for their milk. You might have sheep for fiber or for milk or for meat. But let's jump back for a second, not just the yields that you get in terms of products out of your livestock. Let's jump back to where we were talking about the force of disturbance that my poultry are in the landscape and how they each kind of do different things. First, I'm gonna pause because the girl turkey, I don't know if you can hear her, is desperate to be taken out. So give me a second, I'm gonna pause and I'll be right back. All right, so now there's a little bit less squawking because leggy blonde is where she wants to be. Okay, so where was I? When we are talking about utilizing our livestock, hi baby, we're talking about utilizing our livestock in a way that benefits our permaculture system, not only for the yields that they can produce, but for the labor that they can give. With the Facebook groups that I manage, one of the most common questions I see is, I have a vacant field that has been left fallow. It's full of weeds and really compacted soil. What is the permaculture no-till way to get this field ready for planting, be it planting um, you know, annual veggies or be it planting a food forest? What's my permaculture strategy here? Oh, she's preening my hair. Oh, hi, baby. So my advice to all of these folks, again, this is a little academic on my part, but it's what I've read other farmers do with great success. And so I feel confident in recommending this strategy is that if you want to take a fallow field, a neglected field, a field that lacks diversity, and you want to transform it into a useful permaculture space, think about the labor that you can get for free off a diversity of livestock. Step one, come in with your grazers or your browsers, depending on what is growing there. Maybe there's some shrubby material. Maybe you need to start with, hi, sweetie, she's just preening my hair like crazy, hi. Maybe you want to come in with your goats first, because maybe you have more shrubs that you need to deal with. Maybe you want to come in with a rotation of cattle or sheep, because you're looking at more of a grassland situation. Bring in your browsers and your grazers first. Let them work the land quite heavily and strip things back. Next, you want to come in with pigs. Let them be the second step in regenerating your landscape. The pigs will root around, particularly if you throw out some corn or some other fodder that they like, the pigs will root around and they will take those plants that you want to get rid of, that your browsers and grazers have already stripped and weakened, and they will uproot them and turn them over. And in the process, expose lots of grubs, lots of insects. Then you want to rotate in your poultry. You want to throw in your chickens who will continue to scratch and further break down those uprooted plants. They will get rid of all of the pests. They will get rid of seeds that are dormant in the soil. And then you can think about planting. But additionally, this pattern does for your system of throwing in browsers and grazers, throwing in pigs, throwing in poultry in a three-step system. Is it every single step along the way you are adding rich nitrogenous manure to the landscape and you are adding fertility. So this technique of rotating in various livestock and using them as free labor, a free source of enriching the ground through their manure, a free source of then food at the end as they have taken the weeds and the grubs and the seeds and they have turned them into milk and meat and eggs. That is how I love to explain permaculture to people. We are using the biological, inherent, instinctual behaviors of our animals, and we are letting them just do their thing. We're letting them go out into the landscape and just do what they love to do, what they're bred to do, what they're meant to do. We're letting them exhibit all of their natural behaviors and live a good and happy life. Hi, baby. And as a result, we are getting the work done that we want to get done. We are enriching and healing the ground and we are getting a yield of food. That is the essence of permaculture. 
It is using systems to try and heal depleted landscapes in a way that minimizes labor and stress and suffering for people, that works with the natural landscape, works with the plants and animals and fungal life that is there in order to bring areas that have been decimated, that have been depleted, areas that are struggling with a lack of biodiversity and restore diversity and abundance in a way that continues to feed people, in a way that enriches the landscape, in a way that it enriches our lives, and in a way that sustainably cares for and feeds people. So when I talk on this channel about the way that I am trying to diversify my landscape, that's just a tiny homage. It's just a tiny snippet of the way that that can work in broad, large scale permaculture. It's just a tiny little view into the possibilities that we have with permaculture. So think about the ways that you can utilize livestock in your permaculture system, be it a small one like my quarter acre garden or be it fast acreage. Hi baby. Use your livestock in a way that lets them live a full and happy life, that works with the way the livestock wants to live, that utilizes their natural strengths in order to get a yield of food or fiber from them, in order to enrich your soil through their manure, in order to have them do the labor that is not a labor for them, it's a joy, it's them living out the way they naturally want to be, but utilize your livestock in a way that gets all of the stacking functions, right? That gets so many benefits. Let's embrace diversity in our permaculture design with our livestock and embrace just the sheer potential of diversity in all aspects of permaculture for how that enhances our resilience. So thanks for watching today. I would love to hear in the comments from those of you who are doing much more large scale permaculture, how that's working for you especially how you're using livestock that I'm not able to use here, that I'm just able to admire from afar. I'm a big fan of y'all that are able to undertake that. Um, I feel that permaculture needs to be diverse. It needs to work in urban settings. It needs to work in suburban settings. It needs to work in rural settings. And I will forever be a mm, somebody who romanticizes and idealizes that kind of rural permaculture, but I'd love to hear how it works for you. I'm gonna go eat dinner. I've had an exhausting day. I'm gonna feed these guys their dinner first, make sure they have fresh water and everything they need to bed down for the night. And I will be back tomorrow with a lot more. There's a lot of exciting things happening in our garden this week. In the interim, please check out my Patreon. Thanks.